NBA contracts become guaranteed later this week. That doesn't sound like much if you don't know much about what it means, but it means a lot of player movement could be coming. And for the Pacers, we have three guys that could be impacted by that deadline. They have a lot to consider coming up. So we've got a lot to talk about on today's Locked On Pacers podcast. You are Locked On Pacers, your daily Indiana Pacers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Welcome in to another edition of the Locked On Pacers podcast, where we, of course, talk about the Indiana Pacers as always. My name's Tony East. I cover the team for Forbes and the West Side Community News. And today it is now January 4th, which sounds like nothing to you, but that means in three days, if a player is not cut, their contract is guaranteed for the rest of the season. And for the Pacers, we have three guys on non guaranteed deals. And for the NBA as a whole, with the millions of guys, that's a stretch, but on non guaranteed deals, it's a big deadline coming up, some roster shakeups coming up. And for teams that might be making trades, like the Pacers, uh, having roster flexibility is pretty nice. So I got to break down what to expect from the Pacers potentially coming up this week. And joining me to do that, another cap dork. This is dangerous. Two cap dorks in one room. Could lead to millions of conversations. Mr. Yozi Goslin himself from Hoops Hype. How's it going, man? I'm doing all right, Tony. I'm glad to finally meet you and be on the show. I'm very excited to talk very specific, low-stakes salary cap stuff with you. <laughs> it, it is low-stakes in general, but the ripple effects from the low-stakes stuff is what the high-stakes stuff is, right? Like, the Lakers just... Like the contract guaranteed it's coming up, and they just dumped Rondo for a guy who's not guaranteed so they could save a bunch of money that they might spend later this season on someone who actually is important, right? Like that's the kind of stuff that this deadline kind of predates when you look at what these these dates end up meaning. And so the, ru- the rule is, or the date is actually January 10th on the calendar that the contracts become fully guaranteed, but that's misleading because the player has to be completely off of waivers before the 10th for the contract to be off the books. Uh, which in clearing waivers takes 48 hours. So they have to be waived by the 7th, which is Friday. It's very stupid. They do a poor job explaining it to people who don't read a bunch of crap. So by Friday, basically, all these players who have questionably guaranteed deals, we already saw Denzel Valentine get waived earlier today by the Knicks. Brad Wanamaker got waived by the Pacers. They saved about a million dollars doing that a couple weeks ago. Like the, the stuff's already happening. And we'll get to Pacers players specifically. O'Shea Brissett, Keelan Martin, and Kiefer Sykes are in this scenario. But why this matters to the Pacers is it's an opportunity for them to free up a roster spot and save some money. But it also is a league thing, right? Like other guys could get cut who become available to your team. Like it's a pretty big day for the whole league. Yeah, and you mentioned how teams are already starting to make these types of moves. I don't see a lot of players getting cut compared to last year, for example. I think a good amount of these players on on guarantee deals got waived. And you know, there's not a lot that stick out to me. Uh, we'll, you know, we'll save the Pacers for a little bit, but, you know, a lot of the guys that you would think a team wants to waive, guys like Avery Bradley with the Lakers, Jabari Parker with the Celtics, just a couple of names that stick out. I don't even think those guys are going to get waived. Um, so, and then, like, yeah, you mentioned Denzel Valentine. Wayne Selden got cut today. Brad Wanamaker got cut. It feels like the moves are already happening. So it's I, I feel at this point, like, there, like most of these guys would have gotten – it should be happening already. Um, you know, uh, maybe Cleveland waves at Davis. Um, I don't know. It feels like for the most part, teams are basically uh, – I don't think we're going to get too many waves. I think they, they, they would have done so already. Yeah, usually if there's a surprise, it kind of typically predates like, oh, they were doing this instead that we didn't know was coming or something like that. But I always feel like there's one player per year that I'm kind of like, really? You know, he got cut? That's kind of surprising. And it's always smart or like it's a minor player, so it doesn't actually matter. But there's always one per year that surprises me. And like the Lakers were going to run into that because they really want to keep Stanley Johnson. They made a trade, so it doesn't matter for them anymore. But like. Maybe it was going to be Avery Bradley. Maybe it would have been DeAndre Jordan, whose deal is already guaranteed, but they would have had to cut somebody coming up if they wanted to keep Stanley Johnson. So that's part of what makes this complicated is when you look at it from a team's perspective, especially like the Pacers, who are currently 
running out of backup point guard who they signed a week ago, have a very ineffective bench, a ton of injured players in general, even beyond the health and safety stuff. They might be interested in scooping up someone useful, depending on how they want the rest of their season to go. And the other complicating factor is a lot of the guys you might consider on the fringes of the league, and this is why I'm surprised that, and I, I agree with you that I don't think a lot of people will get cut, but with all these 10-day hardship guys coming in, and some of them performing pretty well, it seems like you've seen up close and personal the guys on the fringes who'd be fighting for these contracts play more recently. I kind of thought they would complicate it and make teams have to kind of think twice about, oh, maybe we want Isaiah Thomas instead of whoever. Not Isaiah Thomas hasn't been that good, but you know, in general, that kind of discussion has come up. And so I think that there are more complications in a tip than in a typical year, despite the fact that there might not be that many cuts this year. Yeah, I was a little expected that I'm sure like one or two guys were going to end up getting roster spots. It looks like there's going to be a lot more. A lot of them are getting like two-way opportunities mainly. Um, uh, who, I, I forgot who was it who just got a – Quindary Weatherspoon on the Warriors. He just got a two-way spot. Uh, there's a couple other ones of these. Um, now you do have a couple players that are actually making regular season rosters. It feels like – at some point, the Lakers will give Stanley Johnson a regular contract. They're just, I, I think what the one thing that the, these 10 day hardships are doing is incentivizing teams to delay uh, doing any official roster move, especially a regular season signing, because these hardship 10 days don't count against the cap. So if you've got someone with COVID, you could automatically sign these guys to a 10 day and you're just buying time. And uh, for the Lakers, for example, they don't have anyone with COVID right now in the protocols. So they are, they can, if they want Stanley Johnson to play tomorrow, they'll have to give him a regular contract. Otherwise they can let him not play tomorrow and then sign him to a 10 day on Friday. And then maybe they could like just, del- just delaying it saves teams money, which is important coming into the deadline to have as much flexibility as possible, especially in regards to luxury tax and, with the Pacers, they're in a spot where they are very close to the luxury tax, but I'm not too worried about them needing to maximize it. Uh, should we just get into that? <laughs> yeah, you know, the tax would have been more of a concern, I think, if some bonuses were looking a little more likely, but basically every bonus they would have been worried about is not going to hit. Unless unless the bonus has, like, the most ridiculous next two weeks ever. Like, I don't think any of their big bonuses are going to hit this year which is nice for their tax flexibility. And so, you know, for a while when they were hovering within a million of it before they cut Wanamaker and Dell Edmund Sumner, it was looking a little sketchier, but they they have sort of sorted that out. And yeah, that teams can sign actual real 10 days, non-hardship 10 days starting on uh, Wednesday, right? The 5th. So Wednesday, yeah. I, I don't that, know that, right. that even more complicates things. Like maybe the Lakers want to sign Stanley Johnson to 10 days for a few weeks and then the trade deadline. So it's all going to be weird. Moves are coming. And the Pacers have three guys who could be involved. Although I really doubt, I really doubt two of them will get cut. Hey guys, let's take one quick little break to talk about the good folks over at Truebill because do you know why free trials renew without your consent? Because it is a business scam out to get you. Don't let greedy corporations pocket your money. Download Truebill to take control of your subscriptions. Truebill is the new app that helps you identify and stop paying for subscriptions you don't need, want, or simply forgot about. On average, people save up to $720 per year with Truebill because companies make subscriptions hard to cancel. Truebill makes it simple. Just link your account and Truebill will cancel your unwanted subscriptions in one tap and your Truebill concierge is there when you need them to cancel unwanted subscriptions so you don't have to. They have over 2 million users that help them save over $100 million like Matthew B who says in a matter of seconds I saved $660 for the year on my direct TV bill, saved $120 for the year on my serious bill and $840 a year on car insurance. Don't fall for subscription scams. Start canceling today at Truebill.com slash NBA. Go right now. Truebill.com slash locked on NBA could save you thousands a year. Truebill.com slash locked on NBA. And I think everyone who follows this team knows it. Uh, Keelan Martin and O'Shea Brissett, both on non guaranteed deals. And that last year, Keelan Martin had a case to get cut, right? He wasn't playing at all, non guaranteed last year, no guarantee the following year. They could have waived him last February and had no money on the books. And they said, no, we like him. He's good. And I was like, that doesn't make sense. And then they kept him this year, and they pushed back his guarantee date, and then they pushed it back again, and then they pushed it back again. And then they added more guarantees, so they could push it back again. 
because nothing yeah. makes sense when the cap is super confusing. But now he's playing good and he's in the rotation, so the Pacers are smart and I'm stupid. And there's no way he's getting cut. And I think you and I DM'd about him like seven times because his date kept getting moved. And this is why you do it because now he's going to be on an NBA team for two straight seasons. Yeah, I remember asking you like, what is, is Keelan Martin getting cut? Like it was our, it would be his guaranteed date, and we don't hear anything. And I think twice or three times they push it back. Um, and now, especially that he's been on the roster, he's been way more valuable during the season than what was probably projected in the off season because the, the Pacers had a lot of wing depth. They made, and this is without counting TJ Warren. They've got Lavert, Lamb, Holiday, Craig, Duarte ended up being amazing. So you would think, okay, maybe you don't need Keelan there. He's pretty expendable. But TJ Warren didn't end up coming back and. The Pacers had a lot of bad injury luck, and, and that's before all the COVID stuff going on. And Carlisle played him a lot, especially in the first month and a half or so. I think, like, once this – around once mid-November started, Martin was getting, like, consistently 20-plus minutes a night off the bench. Uh, recently, I, I just I, – I looked him up. His role seems to have diminished a little bit. But when you're just looking at this whole COVID uh, – you know, stretch of the season going on right now. And just Warren doesn't seem like he's coming back anytime soon. And you never now trade deadline is coming up. Maybe they move some guys. It's very valuable to have as much wing depth as possible. And because, yeah, I, you already pretty much said it is, it seems, doesn't make sense for them to cut Martin right now, uh, even to save, but like, if they cut him on what, Friday, they would save a million dollars off the luxury tax, but there's other ways they could clear more flexibility if they need to. Yeah, there's a much easier way that that we'll get to that later. And, and even trades like like what happened with Denzel Valentine, the way that he his million got saved is he was traded with cash. And what that does is is it removes the players cap it from your sheet completely, assuming you have no money coming back. And even after a contract gets guaranteed, you can do that. Like. For people who really keep up with the Pacers transactions, two years ago they took in uh, two minimum players from the Rockets and a second round pick, uh, and then just immediately cut those guys. So they got a second round pick for taking on that money and the minimums, and you can do that anytime, right? So like if their contract's guaranteed, they're not like locked onto the team for a while, but you know that kind of stuff is still possible. But that you know with Keelan who had five hundred thousand guaranteed, he's already passed that amount. I think he's at what is it like eight hundred thousand now for two year minimum guys, it's something like that. Um, yeah, so like you know. You, you, like you said, the easiest way to look at it when they come Wanamaker, they save the million. You could same thing, kind of look at it with Brissett and Martin if they get cut. Yeah, well, we'll briefly get to Brissett momentarily. There, I mean, that, that's just going to be a waste of time. But yeah, yeah. Martin. I, before the season, I agree with you. Like there was a crowded wing rotation. I didn't think he'd even make the team for a while because of that. And he fought to make the team. And then Carlisle like started him in Detroit, and he was playing all these key minutes with these other guys out. And then Holiday got COVID, and he was playing a bunch. And there were times where he's been, in fact, for most of the season, he's been better than Torrey Craig. Carlisle continues to lean on him. I think right now, if he wasn't in health and safety himself, he'd be playing like 30 minutes a night. Like they just played Dwayne Washington over 30 minutes as they're starting two guard on a two-way a couple nights ago. So their present need, they need him a lot. And in general, they need him a little bit. And if it's a minimum player who's playing in your rotation at all, I, it doesn't matter who they are, you keep them. Like that's just how the cap works. You're getting way more value out of Keelan Martin in the minimum i think there's no way he gets cut maybe like a 0.1 percent chance if if he gets drastically hurt between now and friday or something but he it just doesn't really make sense given their situation that they would say yeah we need the savings more than we need this bench wing who's playing in our rotation like if you rebuild or retool because the trade deadline is going to be a consideration for them right roster spots might actually be helpful for the pacers in two for one deals or saving money if they do do a deal like that but cutting Martin doesn't help you because you would like a minimum player at his skill level anyway. So there's got to be better ways to save money than that. I don't think there's any way he gets cut, despite thinking for much of the offseason that it made a lot of sense to cut him. The Pacers made the right choice, and keeping him around on the deal that they have him on is smart. And the last factor, sorry, I've been rambling so much, they can make him a restricted free agent after this year if they really want to keep him. And if you cut him, you can't do that. So there's a lot of reasons to keep him around and very little reason not to keep him around. I think it's basically a lock he stays on the team. Right. And, you know, despite the Pacers being where they are record-wise, they're technically still in it. Like, they could still get into the play-in. 
I'm, you know, I'm still pretty, I'm, I'm not paying too much attention to the Pacers, but I'm still pretty surprised that with the talent roster they have and the coaching that they have, that they're not currently in the play on playing mix, but there, it's, there's, they could still come back. And ideally, if this team was fully healthy, which, you know, like that, that hasn't been a, the case, but like if this team was fully healthy, Kaelin Martin and O'Shea Brissett are, wouldn't be in the rotation. And that's like nothing against them, but just to show how deep this Pacers team could be, that they they are amazing third string guys to have. Uh, Brissett and Kaelin Martin just to have like as insurance in case something happens. But, um, you know, so, you know, again, just for what they're making and the like the production they could provide in case injuries do happen, which yeah, it has happened. They're like, I think other teams would love to have them based on what they've shown for the Pacers so far. Like Brissett, especially last year, once Turner went out, he was playing, he was starting, he was playing really well. Um, you know, maybe I maybe he's not like a bona fide like seventh or eighth man off the bench just yet, but for like what the Pacers could be when fully healthy for him to be like the 10th or 11th man. That's one of the best 10th or 11th man you could get. Uh, I think O'Shea would play fully healthy. He's been that good for the last okay. two years for them. Like he, he would put, he's definitely been better than Craig who before the season, you know, those are the two guys who are going to push each other for minutes and it's definitely crowded. Like he'd have to split some time with Justin holiday, but he has been, especially this, the last month in December, he, he has been like the only reason their bench has not been a complete disaster. He has been really good this year. Okay. And this isn't even a discussion. His deal's not guaranteed this year. That's cute, whatever. Next year, he's a team option again, and they can still, after that year, make him a restricted free agent. There is no way he gets cut. He'd get claimed. Keelan Martin might not get claimed. He might. O'Shea Brissett would get claimed if he got cut. Like, there's no way. It would make no sense. It'd be the dumbest thing Kevin Pritchard's ever done in his time as president because he's great. Like, he's a rotation player on the minimum. It doesn't make any sense. There are way more effective ways to save one point six or one million dollars, whatever, than waving O'Shea Brissett. I don't even want to spend more breath yeah, on that. I think this is O'Shea's last uh, off season. He could be restricted. Oh, because he switched teams. I'm, I'm pretty yeah. sure, like after this, like this off season, he could be restricted and that's it after. Maybe they turn down the team option and make him restricted. It might be worth it. He's only twenty three yeah. right now. No, no, that's definitely something to start. Look, I'll look forward to them to see what what they should do about that. Yeah. Or extend, I don't know. There's a lot of options coming in. Yeah. The, the, the fact that they have all these options, extension, restricted free agency, pick up the team option, keep him again next year on the minimum, and he's in the rotation, and he's 23, which is an undersold part of him on a rebuilding team, is that he's 23. Like, that's what you want if you're a team that is trying to pivot directions as a young guy who's good. There's no way. No way he gets cut. There's absolutely no discussion yeah, for it. 100%. You're right. Skipping that. Going to the guy that actually makes some sense – here for many reasons and we're going to talk about Kiefer Sykes for a long time right now not only because it makes a little bit of sense to cut him to me but because his deal and his situation with the team kind of makes him very interesting in trades to me and I have a lot to explain I am going to do something I hate doing I'm going to I came up with fake trades and they are the lamest fake trades in NBA history you will laugh at this how stupid they are but they I think have utility for NBA teams let's talk about Kiefer Sykes first they just signed him uh, a few weeks ago if he sticks with the team the whole season, his cap, it's only like 550000 or something. It's really low. He's giving them already more at backup point guard than they got from Wanamaker. Like, it makes sense why they brought him in. He's been fine. He's still non-guaranteed this year. They could cut him if they decide to go another direction. And this is kind of why who gets cut from other teams is interesting to me because if, if any other randomly somewhat useful point guard gets cut, maybe the Pacers sniff around because Brogdon's always hurt and McConnell's out till. March or later. That's why they did this in the first place because Kiefer Sykes is starting for them right now. Like that's their point guard situation. And that's kind of why maybe he doesn't get cut. He's been okay. And he's starting right now. Like they kind of need him, but he's definitely a replacement level. He's only been in the NBA for a few weeks. It's not like they can't find his production somewhere else. And so it's not insane to me that they would cut him if they like somebody else better. It's not insane to me that they would sniff around a trade that could get them more value at that position from another point guard. And we'll get to that. But what do you think about the idea of his his guarantee date being, you know, him getting cut before the guarantee date? Because opening a roster spot could have as much value as him, even though the Pacers would have no point guards in that case. I would feel very neutral about that. Uh, I was pretty surprised he got 
uh, signed to a regular contract instead of a two-way. Uh, and if he was waived on Friday, he would count the 75K. So versus his, the uh, uh, 550 or so. Okay, so you save like 400,000 or so. Um, so, you know, it's not so much for the money. I, and again, like you're not really saving that much as far as create, you're not really creating flexibility. It just do you think this guy has a potential role at least next year i think you got to look at that because especially because then you can make him he's got the he's you know he's got the team option you actually they could actually make him restricted this off season uh so and then they could give him like a four-year minimum deal you know they could they could hinky it completely non-guarantee it so i think just based on the fact that they gave him that team option i feel like they'll keep him and uh you know, try to, you know, give him more, give him more time to evaluate, you know, just any more, I think it's, it's only been like a week, right? Definitely needs yeah. some more time. Doesn't really, they're not really creating flexibility by cutting him. And then like, if he pans out, does really well, uh, they see some promise, decline that player option, give him like a three, four year deal. Yeah. Neutral is exactly how I would feel too. And if they were, if they were like 20 and 18 or 20 and 17, like where they thought they would be right now. And, maybe in the hunt to be good in the playoffs, and then they might need a buyout spot, then I think cutting him would make more sense because then they'd have enough to use the rest of their MLE and actually bring in someone useful in March when buyout time happens. But they're not good. They're 14 and 23. They're about to pivot completely, it sounds like, or pivot somewhat at least. I don't I don't know the whole scope of that, but that kind of ruins the point of the buyout market for your team unless like a young guy gets cut for some reason. So. And at that point, you just cut him anyway. It's only 500000 It's not like it's burning a huge hole in your owner's pocket or anything. That, that's the kind of level of flexibility that doesn't really matter. I agree with you that the team option does kind of make me think he's a better shot of staying. And the fact that they liked him enough to make this move at all in December when they could have just cut Wanamaker two weeks later and not done it at all, right? That There are a lot of signs that say he's probably going to make it through the whole season or at least make it till trade deadline-ish like last year the Patriots cut Jalen LeCue who was fully guaranteed right at the beginning of the of um, the buyout season so like it's not crazy he could get waived even later down the line but the savings just aren't worth it to me uh, unless they find another option like immediately uh, but with Brogdon out and Laverta protocols and McConnell out for a while I mean they <laughs> they'd be playing Lance Stevenson for the next 10 days at point guard and I don't even know who else could could do it in his absence. They have no one in their guard rotation right now. That honestly might be the biggest thing in his favor. But you also mentioned the reason that I came up with fake keeper Sykes trade today. And that is because if he gets cut at the deadline of guarantees, it's only like 75,000 charged to the cap sheet. Oh, for the team well, that cut. Um, so uh, I should have, sorry to like, bur- there, you know, I don't think he can be traded because they just signed him. Oh, have to duh. Be like- yeah, you gotta be like that. Uh, completely you know, ruins my whole you, thing here. Yeah, like, I mean, we could go. Th- we could quickly go through them anyways. But well, I was gonna well, say, I, just, I, I didn't even realize that. Like, and now you're saying it. I'm like, wait, you, no, yeah. yeah we well, it's months. funny because I I was thinking today before I forgot about trade rules, like trading him for Jordan McLaughlin, and then the Timberwolves who are sniffing the tax would be like, oh my gosh, mm-hmm. we could save 1.5 million dollars, and the Pacers could get a much better third point guard. Or the other one was him for Dennis Smith. For Portland, who is over the tax, and they could save like a whole minimum, yeah. and Dennis Smith would be more valuable to the Pacers than Kiefer Sykes. And I was like, "Oh, this is great! I literally have Portland. it all out here." Wow, yeah, if you can just it. sign a guy to like that little amount of money midseason and trade them like automatically, and you know that's that's like a cheat code. Any any uh, uh, interested team would take. I advantage. can't believe I didn't think of that. I even typed yeah. Jordan McLaughlin can't be traded in my notes because I I realized that trade was ruined because he got. He got a the pay bump because he got non-bird. This is oh, too hard. Yeah. People don't care. Yeah, We've been right. saying a lot of words like kinky special and non-bird that people don't care about. So never mind. That ruins a lot of what I wanted to talk about here because – Well, so there, have, have, have you been talking on your podcast about general Pacers trades, like fake trades, stuff like that? Um, I've been trying to avoid it until the 15th on purpose. Oh, okay. Because then everybody can be traded and then we'll really – like. Their schedule gets really hard in mid-January, too, so it could be very obvious what direction they're headed in 12 days or 11 days from now. So I've been kind of putting it off. I have a list of guys that I think they could they could pursue, but I don't. I have not really echoed them beyond, oh, yeah, they could make this minor trade of, like, 
Keelan Martin for DeAndre Bembry or something that saves the Nets a little bit of money and gets the Pacers a point guard. But that that's you know that's kind of what I was thinking for this segment. Even though they can't trade Sykes, like they could save the Nets some money by doing the trade I just said. But they need Keelan Martin, so maybe they wouldn't do that. So T.J. McConnell is the only Pacer who can't who can't be traded until the fifteenth. Uh, Brogdon can't be traded all year. Either. Yeah, he can't get traded. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, I I'll, I'll let me ask you this though, like how sick? I was looking through the history of Pacers midseason trades in the past twenty years, and I'll just give you I'll just <laughs> give you the one, huh? Oh, like two or three of them, yeah. Well, a little more. So I'll give you the ones that like stand out the most. So twenty years ago, they brought in Ron Artest. That there's it was like a bigger trade than that. But they brought him in in 2002. You can say very, very significant midseason trade. Yep. Um, I'm just saying like most significant ones. So like involving players that were really good. Because uh, for the most part, the, when the Pacers make very big trades, it's it's in the off season. If like in the past, you know, 20 years or so. After that, there was our test for Sayakovich in 2006. There was the Warriors trade in 2007. <laughs> With like Dunleavy Murphy for Jackson Harrington, pretty big trade. Um, 2014, I mean, this one just kind of stuck out, but in the long in in the long run, did not matter. Danny Granger for Evan Turner and Lavoy Allen, just because I guess Danny Granger's name, but I, he was already he was already done at the time. And then uh, last year, Victor Oladipo uh, for Karis LeVert. and I think the thing that that sticks out about a lot of these trades is that. A lot of them kind of stem from maybe a player wanting out, like Ron Artest, or like a certain, uh, you know, or Victor Oladipo for Karis LeVert. And the Pacers are now looking at potentially moving one of Sabonis or Miles Turner. And, and I guess that would be more reminiscent of that Warriors trade in 2007, just because that was like a significant part of their core that they traded for a significant part of another team score. It was like a very, it was a pretty significant shift. Uh, you know, didn't necessarily make them better or worse, but it was a big change. And I guess if the Pacers do trade one of them, it would probably, my opinion would probably be for like an equally talented player, just that might fit better. Um, Cause I would say that 2007 trade stuck out the most where it's like, okay, like th- this, ha- this doesn't really have to do so much with like the players themselves. Like we just need to make a change. Yeah. That everything post brawl was kind of fueled differently as well from a trade perspective. You know, they had different, uh, different things pushing them towards doing those things. But since in, since Pritchard took over their only significant mid season trade, is the Levert one. And they're, really, it's their only significant trade at all. Like, the Warren yeah. trade turned out to be significant, but at the time, like, he he got salary dumped. Like, they, they have not really been a big, significant trade team for, like, a decade, basically. Yeah. So it's going to be interesting to see how they handle that, and that'll really heat up, uh, yeah. basically starting this week, but really starting on the 15th. So, you know, but maybe they won a free or not. But. I would say that if, if the bonus or Turner are traded – I think that would that would probably trump all these uh, midseason trades from the past twenty years. Oh yeah, I agree like, for sure. So technically, this could be the most significant, the biggest trade, a big trade deadline in Pacers history. Just just to put out like how generally inactive they try to be. Yeah, the next the next month is is the most like pivotal roster building time for them they've had in a long time. Like when they were trying to keep PG after the two conference finals years, that was a big time, and they really blew that. I mean, even the Granger trade at the time, it, it, you can look back and like understand why they did it. Although it doesn't, it didn't make sense really at the time. Like he yeah. was tight with the team, and Evan Turner was nothing, and Lavoy Allen wasn't that good. Like the post brawl stuff is whatever, and they, you know, I think they didn't they trade Brad Miller for on our test the first time, and like Brad Miller was an all star here. Like some very suspicious thing in trades in retrospect. Like this month. Since like 2000, basically, since they made the finals, this is maybe like their biggest roster movement month in terms of importance, not in terms of volume, like ev- yeah. like uh, of my life, basically. It's very, it's going to be very fascinating to see how they handle it. And step one starts this week, which is why I wanted to do a whole podcast with someone who understands it. But 
yeah, it, you're totally right. That and and Carlisle even brought up earlier this week. He's like, this franchise doesn't really make midseason trades. Or that was a couple weeks ago now, but and he's right. They don't they don't typically do it, but they they're going to be in a position where they might have to. So I have no idea what to expect. It's going to be wild. Yeah, I, which so just looking at their history though, I'm just I'm also preparing to not be shocked if they don't do anything crazy. Like if the biggest player they trade is Jeremy Lamb, that also wouldn't shock me. Yeah, or like Tory Craig to a contender or something. Yeah. Yeah, that yeah. kind of stuff wouldn't surprise me either. But I just – the thing is, I don't want to get too into the weeds with this stuff, although people love trade talk. Yeah. I've said this a ton of times on this show. Even beyond Turner being good and potentially being in the wrong role playing next to another center, he's expiring after this year. And even though he's good, like his value will just drop naturally. Like that's just how it works for players of his talent level when they become expiring. So there is pressure to either move him or move the guy – preventing him from being in the peak role where then you're more comfortable paying him again. So th- this is the time, like this is it. Yeah. So that this, this week is the start of that. Like all these decisions are the, st- even though uh, like we kind of walked through, it's unlikely they, they cut anybody. They still could see how the league is changing, see what becomes available. And then all the guys become tradable on the 15th. And then it all goes crazy because the deadline is two days more than a month away. It's February 6th, right? I think 10th. I should know that. <laughs> that's that's. A, I should have that written on the back yeah. of my hand, so I like can never. But, you know, you're 100 percent right about uh, about what you said about Turner's value, and I look at it kind of like, in a he's like in a similar situation as Aaron Gordon was last year with the Magic, where he had one more year left on his deal, and then yeah, if he was still on the Magic right now, probably I don't think they'd be getting as much for him now as they uh, as they got last year. And I think the Pacers could probably get a little more than what the Magic got. I, I really like what the Magic got for Aaron Gordon. And then Gordon got that extension because, you know, it was like a very natural type of extension. Like, like it definitely made sense, I mean, for him. Uh, Turner can get four years, $94 million, I believe, and an extension this offseason. So that's another thing the Pacers got to look at because I think that also makes a lot of sense for him to earn. Um, especially in an NBA where veterans now are taking extensions because the cap is not really rising for the next few years. Uh, if you're Indiana, do you want to pay Turner, you know, 20 million plus and maybe up, it, it goes up to like maybe 26, 27 million on the back end of that. That's another thing they got to look at because I think whoever trades for him, good chance they offer that. Yeah, I agree. I don't think the well, if they, if they tried to bonus, maybe they'd offer that. But as constructed, no chance he's getting that extension. Um, it's so hard to like. The problem fans have too is is contracts were so low for so long, and the spike was so sudden that they hear twenty six million for turn. And they're like, no way, whoa! But like, you got to look around the league at some of these deals people have been getting. Like that, solid starters cost like mid twenty millions now. It's it's crazy how the cap just jumped out of nowhere. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I don't, I think if Turner was making twenty six million now. That's still fine. Like, just to show, like, I, he's, he's definitely like I was very low on Turner, especially after I got a real good look at him in the bubble. I just felt like wasn't bringing much, wasn't contributing at all. Kind of like I was, I, I felt he was like the Andrew Wiggins of big men. But then last year, he really broke out. Finally, I thought was hitting like his his potential, and now this season he's building off of that, so he knows for real, and he's definitely outplaying what he's earning now. Um, you know, I I guess with the Sabonis Turner conversation, just what do the Pacers want to do? Do they want to get the most assets? Because in that case, you probably got to move Sabonis. Uh, if you want to keep Sabonis, you could definitely get a lot for Turner. I think because there should be. A lot of teams interested in him. Maybe you won't get like the haul Sabonis can get you. I think Sabonis could get you something like what the Magic got for Vucevic. But um, you know, that's just the kind of thing they gotta. They'll be weighing if if they do move one of them. Yeah, I I, I still think it's possible that they get there and they go, okay, who are we getting more for? And then they pull that trigger. We'll see. I don't know. I don't know how they're how they're thinking, but we might find out in the next like week or so. I mean, it's, it's crazy how much can be telegraphed from such minor moves coming up, but that's the fun of the NBA and the fun of being a cap org is you can predict random crap. Like me typing yeah. out Kiefer Sykes for Dennis Smith as a real trade. I would consider if the Pacers legally were allowed to do it, 
but they're not. And you're here to shoot me down and I have fun ideas. <laughs> Yuzzy, where can people follow you and all your awesome work? Uh, you guys can follow me on Twitter at Yossi Goslin, and you can read my work at Hoopsite. Um, I'm going to be pretty, it's getting a lot busier for me as far as content goes. Lots of, I'm writing, I write about every team. Um, at some point, I'm going to have a very big trade primer. I did this last year. It was like 7,000 words. So I'll be talking about every team. Maybe that comes out a week or two before the trade deadline, but you know, for general NBA salary cap content, check me out on Hoop Type. There are very few people who I think know the salary cap better than me. You are listening to one of them talk right now, ladies and gentlemen. Give Yozzy a follow over on Twitter. This show is at Locked On Pacers and me at T East NBA. If you have any questions about the silly salary cap minutia we talked about today, please do not hesitate to ask. We'll be back tomorrow to talk. Knicks, Nets, all the stuff the Pacers have going on this week because they've got a tough back-to-back and Lance Stevenson playing at home against Kyrie Irving on Thursday. What? Never thought I'd say that sentence on this show this week. So thank you guys for listening. Hope you'll be back tomorrow. And until then, have a good one.